Thank you. And thank you guys for the opportunity to present today. So, I have no disclosures. I think of these problems a little bit as isolated issues that overlap rather than things that always go together. And um, this was a fast clicker. I, um, oh, no, it went back. There we go. And first, I just want to talk about where, you know, you intersect between GERD and morbid obesity. So a patient who has both of those problems. And I just want to stress that the patient who presents with GERD but happens to be morbidly obese is a very different patient than the patient who presents with morbid obesity and happens to have GERD. And so the discussion is different, the way you frame the options are different, and what the patient wants might be different. Obese patients have lower LES tone, and um, that goes up as their weight goes up, and they tend to have um, more intraesophageal reflux for that reason. And increased BMI comes with increased abdominal pressure, right? So this is a study, it's, it's old, but it looks at bladder pressures in the morbidly obese, uh, mean BMI was 55. And the bladder pressure in morbidly obese patients is over twice as high, um, almost on par with intra-abdominal hypertension. So there's a lot of pressure at the hiatus. It's a hostile, hostile area. So um, what about a laparoscopic fundoplication? What is the data? Um, Data is what it is. Um, there's a lot of data. It goes both directions. I'm going to give you both directions of it. Um, these are some studies that support that pre-op BMI does not influence the clinical outcome following laparoscopic anti-reflux surgery. So the first study is a, um, it's a, a single institution study, 481 patients. 55 of these were morbidly obese, all underwent a lap fund application. And they followed them for quite a while. The group that's morbidly obese or obese and morbidly obese had a longer OR time, but otherwise similar outcomes, similar reoperate. You can see that uh, rate in the column or the table on the right. Second study uh, looked at 140 patients with objective uh, data. The first study was just you know symptom scoring. Now, pre-op and six months post, they found a hi uh, higher GERD HRQL scores in those who underwent fund application and were morbidly obese as compared to normal weight. But their pH scoring, their objective reflux rate was similar. And the reoperate rate in that series was very low. And there's also studies that support that morbidly obese patients have a higher risk of failure after reflux surgery. This study out of Boston is a, quite an old study, but they do follow their patients for three years and they look at um, both latinus and Mark IV and they see uh, a quite higher recurrence rate, right? 31% versus a normal weight patient. So they concluded that morbidly obese patients shouldn't have anti-reflux surgery in the form of a fund application. And this is a series from Morgenthal. 174 patients, they followed for 11 years and they found a 25% failure rate. And they defined failure as either having revisional surgery or being dissatisfied. And they said that a BMI of greater than 35 was associated with failure which sounds terrible until you look at their BMI of 35 group, which only was seven patients. So although I really wanted to be on this side of data, I looked at the studies that we have and I was like, this is, you know, not as great as I would hope to see. Um, a meta-analysis looking at the safety and effectiveness of uh, fund application in obese patients looked at 3,772 patients. And they saw no difference in conversions, no difference in recurrence, no difference in wrap slippage. And they concluded that a high BMI should not be a deterrent to considering anti-reflux surgery. Now, this is what they're talking about, right? BMI of 30, which is probably not what we're thinking about. So I don't know what to do with that data. Um, here's the things that I think about, um, but I don't know how to find good enough data to answer these questions. The construction of a wrap is critical to its success. It's um, my mentor, Lee Swanstrom, talks about it as an art, right? It's, it's not a science. And the hiatus in the obese patient is really a hard place to be, and it's a hard place to do a good fund application. And then all fund applications fail? No, that's not what I meant to say. <laughs> fund applications fail at a, you know, a known rate, 1% per year on average. And a reoperative fund application is one of the most painful operations and it's only made more painful in the morbidly obese. So, 
and this just reiterates the data, BMI 30 to 40 is not um, the data we can use for BMI 40, 50, 60. So we don't really have good data for those patients. So what about a laparoscopic gastric bypass? Here's a study saying that bypass should be the procedure of choice to resolve both obesity and GERD. 53 patients that followed objectively for three years, a great study, right? pH tests and everything. Demeester score dropped and stayed reliably low. Reflux and esophagitis also low. 20% almost rate of esophagitis is not insignificant, right? If we had a rate of esophagitis after fundo that was that high, I wouldn't consider that, you know, a procedure of choice, but. Um, this is an analysis of the Swedish obese um, subjects that looked at 2,454 patients and analyzed their PPI use. And um, I know PPI use is not a great way to follow reflux, but they did see that nearly half of patients were back on PPIs after their bypass. So for me, whose patients are coming to me saying, I don't wanna be on these meds anymore, um, I really hesitate to offer them a bypass and say, for sure, I can get you off your PPIs. I really don't feel strongly that that is reasonable. Um, I'm gonna get a little bit controversial. I'm gonna talk about hiatal hernia um, in the patient who happens to be morbidly obese, but doesn't have GERD, right? So that's a thing, wouldn't think so, but it's true. So here's a study looking at 230-ish patients that are morbidly obese and um, objectively, again, with pH studies. And the control group here is on the left that I've highlighted and the obese group that does not have reflux is far right. So no reflux symptoms. And their pH test parameters are very similar. So that's the group I'm talking about. And this might be the look of that person in the OR, right? Parasophageal hernia or hiatal hernia is a disease of the diaphragm. It's not a disease of the valve. So I'm talking about you know, something more akin to a, almost a ventral hernia repair when I'm thinking about durability. And parasophageal hernia repair is not a great durable operation, right? It's kind of like peristomal hernias. You can't really close the hernia fully, so the recurrence rate almost is gonna be 100% if you watch long enough. But this is a graph I put together of some parasophageal hernia studies that looked at their durability. Um, each one is a certain time frame, right? So it's not a great comparison, but you can see that the longer the study went out, the Oschlager study is the far uh, left one, the higher the recurrence rate, basically. And I think that is telling. And this was normal weight people, but increased weighted operation, um, this Ali et al study in the corner, is independent predictor of recurrence for parasophageal hernia. So, here are some small series looking at parasophageal hernia plus sleeve gastrectomy. I do think it's a reasonable option in the right patient. Um, these uh, series found really decent excess weight loss, which is what I'm looking for to keep a parasophageal hernia repair durable, right? And um, it does have some conversion rate to bypass, of course, and it does have some recurrence rate, of course, because parasophageals do recur. Um, and it does have some recurrent GERD symptoms. And I think all those things are things to think about, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't uh, consider this. So I think it is important to look at the valve. I think of the, the Hill valve a little differently because I think you can have a pretty nice LES that happens to be inside of a hernia. And you know we have EGG outflow obstruction uh, that's concurrent with a parasophageal hernia. So I know that there has to be some LES tone evident in some cases. But what we know about what sleeve does to the valve is that it loosens it, right? It decreases the pressure of the LES and that's how reflux happens. So if you have someone who you see the valve and it's totally blown out on endoscopy, um, then I think that's not the right person to do a sleeve on because you're probably gonna give them raging GERD. Versus someone with some tone, I think it's reasonable. So I think that is an option for that patient population. But I do wanna say that a parasophageal hernia repair plus a rheumatoid gastric bypass works. You know, it's a challenging operation. There's people that describe staging it and doing one part than the other, which sounds like a lot of torture, but it can be done and it, it works. It resolves, you know, people lose weight and um, hernia repair is more durable. So I think that is reasonable. So in summary, you know, the patient with GERD and morbid obesity, RU and Y versus fund application for BMI of, you know, 30 to 40 at the most. We don't have good data beyond. Parasophageal hernia repair, 
plus either weight loss operation or renew your sleeve, very reasonable. And then for someone who happens to have all three, that's a paracephagia hernia and a room. So, and then it's important to just talk to your patient. What are they, what's bothering them? What do they want? <laughs> what do they want to fix? They want to fix their obesity. They want to fix, you know, their symptoms. And what are the risks of what you're proposing? How soon do those risks come? And then how painful is the thing that you might have to do later? <laughs> Thanks.